Welcome to the Equality in Housing series with Housing Options Scotland and the UK Collaborative Centre for Housing Evidence with your hosts Pedro Cameron and Dr Gareth Young. This series explores equality, diversity and inclusion in housing practice and research through sharing stories and experiences from people working across the sector. In this episode, we talk to Charlie McMillan, Chief Executive of the Scottish Commission for People with Learning Disabilities, or SCLD. Charlie spoke to us about the challenges in finding accommodation for people with learning disabilities in terms of availability and system design and the value of joined up holistic approaches. He also talks about SELD's Include for Good project, which aims to change society's view of the status, value and contribution of people with learning disabilities by including their voices in research and policy making. the Chief Executive of the Scottish Commission for People with Learning Disabilities. I'm absolutely delighted to be here, Pedro, looking forward to the discussion. I um, have a background in social work and social care over the last 35 years, and uh, I've been at SCLD for the last four years or so in terms of the Chief Executive role. SCLD is a human rights defender organisation looking at empowering and enabling people with learning disabilities. And, and we're not exclusive in that, that label. It's absolutely about anyone who identifies as someone who uh, with a learning disability is more than welcome at the organisation. And mm. we try to amplify their voice and develop leadership skills and work in partnership with them to ensure that Scottish practice, policy and legislation are based on their human rights and their needs and requirements, not on the best guess of uh, professional staff. OK, and uh, what's your kind of background with that? Have you uh, did you come into it uh, from a third sector perspective or yeah. from? Um, specifically I, learning disabilities? Yeah, no, it's a really good question, actually. I, out of the 35 years I've been working, I've worked in the public sector for four. So right. I have been in the voluntary sector in various uh, guises of various organisations for over 30 years now. Um, mm. My last two jobs were as Director of Operations and Director of Services within large provider organisations, one focusing on mental health and the other for people with multiple and complex uh, disabilities. Mm -hmm. And uh, as I say, my background is in social work, so it's always been in terms of empowerment and ensuring that people receive the best service possible in terms of helping them to uh, achieve their ambitions and their goals. OK, um, and so if we take that into the context of housing and people with learning disabilities, particularly in Scotland and UK wide as well, I guess, from the work that you do and from your experience with SLD, what would you say are some of the, the most pressing issues? Well, there's a whole range of issues in relation to housing and accommodation. I would probably widen it out slightly, Pedro. Housing's at the heart of the, the, the issue, but it can also be about accommodation. It's whatever best suits the individual. And I think, unfortunately, people with learning disabilities have often had their right to independent living ignored mm -hmm. and or um, options given to them that actually don't best suit their needs and their hopes and ambitions. All too often it's what is available rather mm -hmm. than what would best suit this individual. Mm -hmm. I think there's a lack of planning and a lack of transitions planning in particular, um, not just indeed in terms of young people moving out of school and into uh, adulthood, but also at different stages in adulthood as well. I mean, I know, for example, I'm on my ninth or tenth home and uh, people with learning disabilities are all too often given one option and that's where they're expected to remain. There's a lack of choice, there's a lack of control, um, there's a lack of flexibility and there's also a real lack of built environment.
environment that is fully accessible to people with learning disabilities. So there's a whole range of areas of issues and concerns. One more I would probably add in, we also are aware of a growing number of people with learning disabilities, perhaps diagnosed or undiagnosed, but definitely with learning disabilities in the homeless community. Mm -hmm. um, I think one of the things that comes up a lot for us in terms of as an organisation at Housing Options Scotland is that it is it's not just the the availability of the of housing or accommodation but um, or the the suitability um, it's the suitability of the system that allows that as well that sort of um gives people access to that yeah um, i yeah. wonder if you've got any thoughts about so, that so so whether if we go public housing and registered social landlords allocation policies and procedures and that full and detailed understanding of capacity issues can be a primary challenge as well um, but allocation procedures can often actually inadvertently discriminate against people with learning disabilities um, then you're moving into owner occupation and for many people with learning disabilities it's just not even on the list of possible choices people are yeah. just oh no you, you don't want to be doing that and oh there's such a big responsibility or oh no what have you thought about this care home over here so mm -hmm. I, I do think the um stigmatizing and discriminatory attitudes actually limit people's choices further and uh, then the systems we operate often not an easy read not accessible don't use audio versions for example um mm -hmm. you know it, it, it it's very much a written down culture based on in inscrutable information i mean people with a um, you know, university degrees struggle to understand uh, some of the complexities involved in housing and accommodation. And therefore, um, people with learning disabilities must have this information that is accessible to them. It, mm -hmm. uh, one rule does not fit all. So I think there's a whole range of ways in which, again, the system can discriminate. Yeah. Um, and I think as well, the when we're talking about learning disabilities the the tendency is perhaps to look at the more acute or the more um the more complex side of that but even th th that's there's a huge spectrum of sort of disabilities that fall within that and severity of disabilities and things like that which yeah it doesn't seem to be one of the things that we've been talking a lot about is um as part of this podcast is that is intersectionality but what you can even talk about that in terms of the the term learning disability can be thought of what particularly in terms of designing services as a homogenous group so um yeah that 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 yeah. breadth of experiences yeah is no ab absolutely and that homogenous group whose ch needs don't change over time i exactly. think is also a fundamental misunderstanding mm -hmm. um people with learning disabilities are as diverse as everyone else no two people with a learning disability are the same. And I think we absolutely do them a huge disservice and try and put square pegs into round holes all the time because we've got this, this stereotypical view of what someone with a learning disability might need or might be like or might be. Do you know, all of that is so wrong. And there is a huge range of different learning disabilities. Of course. Um, and some people do have profound, multiple and complex disabilities. Sometimes also have are physically disabled. Um, yeah. So you, you've got a, a, a holistic approach is essential if we're mm -hmm. ever going to fully understand the needs of the individual and the individual and their family, their individual with their relationships, and how those might best be met. 
because unfortunately for many, many people with learning disabilities, I use it, borrow a phrase from Beatrix Campbell, who is, uh, who is a writer that I really admire, and she said their futures are already ancient history. And I mm. think for people with learning disabilities in terms of housing and, co and accommodation, their futures are already ancient history because society is going to tell them what they can get. And choice is just completely taken off the menu. Yeah, yeah. Um, so with that in mind, I, I think that brings us to, do you think that there is enough being done at a national level to support people with learning disabilities in housings that they would want or need to live in? And I guess even if, it, if you don't think there's enough, um, if you've got any good examples of um, legislation or um, policy or, um, or or even just sort of examples of good practice um, around that. Sure. Um, there are many, many examples of good practice across the country. Um, I'm aware of uh, one um, example where 12 council houses were built in Midlothian and uh, those tenancies were, were allocated to people with learning disabilities. But those houses could return to the mainstream uh, housing um, provision if needed and required if somebody moves on. I think that's the kind of flexibility that we need to be thinking about. Um, there are then a whole range of design and build uh, housing provisions, um, many with the involvement of um, support providers who are also housing associations, registered social landlords, and also other support organisations and provider organisations in the voluntary sector. Mm -hmm. One of the bits of learning for me is that this has to be multi-agency. Yeah. And not only multi-agency, but multidisciplinary within that. Mm -hmm. I go to far too many meetings where housing colleagues are missed. They're not there. They're not invited. They're not mm -hmm. seen as part of the solution. And this is this is just the, the kind of um, disconnected thinking and silo-based thinking that perpetuates the exclusion of people with learning disabilities. We need all the players, all the disciplines in the room, including the individual themselves, to then work out what provision should look like, what accommodation should look like, and what housing should look like, and the basis on what that housing is going to be allocated as well. Mm -hmm. um, I think that huge strides were made 30 years ago with the hospital closure programme. Yeah. But unfortunately, what that then left us with is a, a group of small group living situations, which may have suited people leaving long term institutions at that point. But it's then about, well, what's the next step? And what's the step after that? Where do people's lives take them in terms of their housing requirements? And how do we make sure that we're working with them? Mm -hmm. Because we know that people, um, people with a learning disability, their needs may change, but they will still have a learning disability. And they are going yes. to need specific supports and also choices mm -hmm. um, as they grow older. And it's building in flexibility. I know a fantastic architect who talks about movable walls, for example, in housing. So that mm -hmm. should someone become um, a user of a wheelchair, then you, you can remove walls in the house quite easily. I mean, we've got to think as creatively as that, whether we're using eye gaze technology, for example, to electrical switches or opening curtains or putting heating on or television or whatever it might be, cooking indeed. Um, that could be built in, but it can only be built in if the people that know about it are there, rather than, as we all too often see, people trying to meet the uh, accessible housing standard, and you put the accessible bathroom as this happened to my parents' house in a private house upstairs. Mm -hmm. I mean, what use is that to anybody if they can't get up to it? I mean, it's, yeah. <clears throat> it's all of those kind of... Um, mistaken and misunderstood approaches. Yeah. Um, however, I do think the voluntary sector and partners in the public sector and housing departments, uh, health and social care partnerships are moving forward in different areas. It's a lack of consistency in that approach, though, that is the real challenge. So you may well get a good response in one area, whereas you're not. 
and there's also a significant lack of advocacy for people with learning disabilities so yeah. that they have experts in their corner advising them people like housing options and i'm not just saying that because i'm speaking to you pedro but, <laughs> but honestly those are the kind of services that people absolutely require who've got their best interests and an awareness of the the choices available at the heart of the work that they're doing mm -hmm. yeah i think um that what you say about advocacy is very true i think even in terms of uh, independent advocacy um, there's not a huge amount of provision for that a country wide there are sort of little pockets of it um but there's not to say for example there's not like a nationwide advocacy service there just uh, it isn't one so there's ones that are central bell space there's ones that are funded by individual local authorities but there's nothing on a national level which can which can offer that kind of service. I think one of the things that we try and do is offer people flexibility within a system that doesn't offer that. Um, so in terms of how, when they speak to people, how they speak to people, or mm -hmm. when they speak to services rather, and when they speak to services, um, and yeah there's not a lot of that and that's a lot down to the resources that are that, that are available and with learning disabilities for example um, and with all sorts of um uh, other kinds of needs that time is is required that time to think about things that time to digest things that time to understand things that time to look closely at all the options that are available to them is just not um, is not available. And I think that thing with multi-agencies multi as well, um, yeah, that, that working in silo is still, it is still extremely a prevalent thing. I, and I, I do think that the move to health and social care partnerships and housing remaining in local authorities added to that um, that challenge that housing colleagues were not routinely in those discussions, which maybe previously they hadn't been because they were all in the one organisation. So I do think that that was a gap. An unintended consequence, but a consequence nonetheless. And we really need to design our systems with yeah. joined up holistic work in mind and an individual at the heart of that. Whatever system it might be, um, I, I uh, have all too often been involved in discussions, and the housing one is no different, where actually the, the person <laughs> requiring the support of the services at the end of the line actually yes. they, they're brought in um oh, here's here's your key it's not the way to do it it's not going to work um yeah. we really need to engage with people as early as possible yes um it's very much a case of something that we see a lot is um sort of uh progressive legislation i suppose or progressive policy within and that's at all levels yeah um, but then the, the sort of go ahead and do it and then the considerations of the actual end user is retrofitted which is never it needs to be sort of embedded from oh, it really start. and that's where some of these good practice examples i mentioned were really strong because people mm -hmm. were at the heart of the planning process now yeah. that means that time is needed because you might be talking about a five-year piece of work you know, yeah, from starting least, these discussions to actually opening the door of a home yeah. might actually take five years but, or more, I, but it can be done quicker as well, I know. But but you need to invest the time and the energy and the resource to make sure that uh, people are heard, their, their needs and requirements are included, and also what they want out of their home. I don't know about you, but I have huge expectations of what my home adds in terms of my quality of life from the colors that it's decorated the finishings <clears throat> excuse me but all of that needs to be um considered um yeah. 
And as I say, there are great um, um, examples. Um, I'm actually speaking at a housing webinar next week uh, with a, an example from Murray in terms of uh, services that uh, Enable are providing, um, ARC Housing, Key, uh, Richmond Fellowship, Enable. I mean, the list is almost endless capabilities. Scotland have got some great, great provision. And usually that has been done in partnership. The voluntary sector are actually incredibly good at partnership working. I think what we do need to do is learn from that and try and do it in a scale. For example, with the coming home report, mm -hmm. I really want to mention the coming home report and the, the Scottish government's efforts uh, in terms of ensuring that people uh, with learning disabilities and autism who are identified as in a delayed discharge situation, mm -hmm. there's a significant piece of work ongoing to bring them home. And that's hence the reason, uh, hence the name of the report, the coming home report. And there's yeah. now an Im implementation plan and I'm, I'm part of a, a network, a large network of organisations and individuals um, involved in, in developing uh, this much greater understanding of who those people are and what they might require to get them out of in some sometimes really unacceptable accommodation in terms of hospital accommodation down south where they've been detained where they're mm -hmm. kept not for a medical reason but because there's no accommodation available no housing solution available so that all has to be unpicked and addressed um we're also really trying to highlight that the, the the solutions and the answers don't necessarily need to be complex. We are involved in some research at the moment with a, a small group of other organisations and it's great as housing associations, CCPS, Scottish Federation of Housing Associations itself. And we're we're undertaking we've commissioned some research in terms of housing support. That mm -hmm. much much ignored and much maligned model actually, and which suffers so much from lack of funding and lack of sustainable funding. But housing support actually can provide some really creative solutions for people. And we're doing some research uh, with the housing colleagues and housing mm -hmm. experts, and uh, hopefully that will be published in the coming months um, mm -hmm. to, to let people see what is possible rather than constantly overthinking oh no there's just no the money for that oh there's no new money these are the lines we hear over and over again but people mm -hmm. continue to live their lives and yeah. people need solutions money can't be the excuse for not doing anything you know yeah. we need to Ab find creative solutions yeah absolutely and i think that's that's interesting is something i was thinking about as you were speaking earlier there about the I think we touched on it earlier, but uh, around the the difference between wants and desires, um, or needs and desires rather, yeah. Um, yeah. but also, so, but also the model of tenancy sustainment and uh, and housing support, which seem to be to me to be two things that are very much at odds. So housing needs is one thing, but then sustaining that need um or sustaining whatever property they got which was deemed to be what they needed rather than what they wanted mm -hmm. um but those wants sometimes are needs in order to if 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 you need someone to, to sustain a tenancy then you need to give them what they want as well as what they as well as what they need Ab absolutely and the only way of knowing that is by working with the individual from the very beginning, yeah. building a relationship, building trust and and communicating in a way in which people absolutely appreciate and understand. And again, there's some fabulous work done in of terms course, of yeah. accessible communication. And uh, that that's to be applauded. And that needs to be built into housing work as well. I, th I personally think people hear the term learning disability and they forget there's a person with a learning disability. It becomes a, a fear factor. Oh, no. Um, oh, we've not got the skills. Well, actually, the skill is actually being alongside somebody, communicating with them, listening to them and yeah. building out from there. Yeah. Um, everything I've found in my 
my life is re relationship based. It's mm -hmm. all about connection. And it is no different in talking about housing and people with learning disabilities. You have to have the connection first before people are going to start opening up about what they might want as well yeah. as what they might need. They know better what they need. Yeah. Um, so it's it's having those conversations and having them in really creative ways um, that explores all the nuances and all the possibilities. And, um, and if someone is deemed not to have capacity, then they still should be involved. And those people who are acting in, in guardianship roles or whatever must be involved and engaged. And if they're not involved and engaged, they need to be challenged because yeah. these are some of the big i know again from houses that I, i've rented and bought in in my lifetime these are some of the biggest decisions i've ever made where do i want to stay um how long do i want to stay there all the you know all yeah. of those kind of things so so um yeah informed decision making empowerment of people and ensuring that they're able to have their human rights respected, protected and fulfilled. It's no rocket science. But unfortunately, we tend to, again, um, convolute and, and make the, the, the messaging about human rights far too complex. We know what fundamental human rights are about. They're outlined in the conventions and actually right to independent living is at the heart of the UNCRPD. We need to be working in Scotland to re realise that for everybody. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, it's uh, something that occurred to me there was that I I think sometimes thinking of people as I don't think always actually thinking when we talk about equalities. So this is this is about equality, diversity, inclusion, and we've been talking to lots of different protected characteristics. But I think in a way, when you start talking about a protected characteristic as a group of people. It sort of it, it others them and it 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 sort of um reduces their or um sort of takes away any sort of agency of um as a as a as a person as a yeah as they a can human go being. further as well it can dehumanize exactly. as well exactly. you, you take away someone's humanity if all you see are the labels you know we we need to accept that people are complicated and they come with multiple identities at different times and as a white able-bodied cisgendered gay man i i am a diverse human being um and and i know what the technical labels might be very little to do though with the choices i want to make on a day-to-day -day basis what i need Absolutely. are my is my ability to make those choices protected that's yeah. what needs to be protected choices available and the right to make those choices. Um, and I do think that we could focus far too much on the labels, mm -hmm. but we've got to also watch that we are sophisticated enough to know that people are different. Yeah. So equality, diversity and inclusion for me is all about difference. It yes. is not about assimilation. It's not about we're all the same because we're not. We're all different and we have different wants, wishes and needs, and those should be accommodated in this society that we live in. That's what the human rights framework is all about. And so it's absolutely about how we move forward positively and enable people to make the choices they want to make. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well said. Um, so um, could you... Uh, talk us through include for good um a little bit and the challenges that you've had with that work um, or and some of the wins as well yeah well it's more about the wins actually um include of for course. good is a new program of work well i say new it's been two years in the making and we're probably about 18 months into the delivery so far include for good has been seen as this SCLD, recruit a group of rapporteurs who are people who investigate issues and then report on them and, and also hold others to account in terms of delivery. Um, and they are all the rapporteurs, they're all people with learning disabilities and they're paid advisors to this organisation. 
So we have 10 rapporteurs who work with us on a, I think two to three days a month is the kind of average. And that's paid a consultancy rate in terms of uh, reimbursing them for their time and their advice. We've co-created the whole programme, which does make things move more slowly maybe than, than sometimes I was expecting, but that's because of the quality of the work that's been done and the impact. Yeah. And the rapporteurs have moved on to identify eight priority areas that they are focusing on moving forward. And they have had an initial discussion with Kevin Stewart, MSP, who's a, a Minister for Mental Health and Social Care, but also has learning disability within his portfolio. So we call him the Minister for Learning Disability as well. And uh, that's been really, really helpful. And we're currently looking at how to go. To, so we were asking Mr Stewart to be an ally, not to sort things out himself, because this is not one person's going to sort this out. Um, but in terms of the experience of people with learning disabilities, how does he help us open doors to those influencers, those decision makers that we really want to impact on? And mm -hmm. so that piece of work is ongoing. <clears throat> What we have seen through this process is the um, absolute ownership, ownership and engagement of people with learning disabilities, the rapporteurs who have just taken over in terms of Include for Good, which is what our intention was. It's absolutely um, fabulous watching them move forward this whole agenda. We facilitate discussions, but really it's very light touch in terms of the energy, the enthusiasm and the direction that all comes from the rapporteurs. And we're here to make sure it has as big an impact as possible without getting in the way. So it's a really innovative piece of work. We absolutely love it. It's funded by SCLD. It's our part of the contribution to uh, enabling people with learning disabilities to change their experience and, and the experience of other people. Um, and uh, my board, the SCLD board, have just been absolutely fantastic in their support. In fact, the other person I would name check in terms of the co-production of this is Eddie McConnell, who's our chair. Um, right. And Eddie's the chief executive of Down Syndrome Scotland. So Eddie has worked with ourselves and also our rapporteurs over the last 18 months to get us to such an exciting place moving forward. Much more to come, but uh, I don't want to I don't want to give away any spoilers. I'll leave that <laughs> to the rapporteurs. You'll hear much, much more. There is a, a microsite, include for good. Dot com. Please check it out. It's all on our web page as well. It's all linked and it's uh, it's an enthralling piece of work and I think it's going to lead to real change. Oh, that sounds fantastic. Um, that's great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to finish up because uh, um, we're um, coming to the end of our time. Um, but I just want to ask, and I think you've kind of covered this with Include for Good in a way, but um, mm -hmm. we're... we're I come at this from um, uh, an advice and information and support angle. Um, Gareth, um, who uh, does the um, project with me, um, comes at it from via cash, um, so and comes at it from a research point of view. Uh -huh. um, and so we're really interested in the role of researchers to support organisations like yourselves. Yeah. And I'm just wondering. It, if in your view there's any gaps in research or anything that you'd like to see academics researching and also and once they've done that research how can they ensure that that um the findings and the evidence and the recommendations are are useful um to organizations like yourself and to those working on the ground Wow. Well, there's lots of really good work ongoing, actually, Pedro. For example, Karen's Watchman's work in Stirling University, Vicky McCall Stirling University as well. Mm -hmm. There's a whole host of work happening through the Learning Disability Observatory at Glasgow Uni. Um, mm -hmm. We work in partnership with four universities at different points and in different ways. Mm -hmm. I think the criteria that I would set for any research would be co-production. And that's absolutely about working with people with learning disabilities 
in partnership, in meaningful partnership, and that does not mean asking them to volunteer. Um, they should be reimbursed like anybody else in terms yes. of paid employment. Um, so that's, that's one of the pieces that I would make, uh, the point that I would make. We really need researchers' help in terms of data collection. Scotland has got a paucity of data collection, and it doesn't matter what aspect of people with learning disabilities lives. We are honestly here time and time again, almost on a daily basis, oh, but we don't collect that information. We don't mm -hmm. ask those questions. No, no, no. We don't want to uh, intrude. Well, if you don't count, you will never know. And yeah. so we have absolutely limited opportunities at knowing what the reality is for people with learning disabilities. They're rendered invisible yeah. by this lack of meaningful, disaggregated data collection, which in itself is a human right in terms of the UNCRPD. Article 31 talks about disaggregated data. We must be collecting it. So to any um, researchers listening, please, please, please disaggregated data. Mm. You then are, you can find in terms of people with learning disabilities experience, it, it relates to most areas of research. So mm. there will be gaps in most things because we don't actually include them. And yeah. if you're not included, you're excluded. So um, I do think there's significant work to be done. I think the Learning Disability Observatory and others are leading the way. But that, mm -hmm. that data collection is a critical issue and including and involving people in that meaningful partnership. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think... Uh... Yeah, that's um, a really good thing. And I, th uh, I think that's been coming up a lot in terms of, so when we talk about data collection um, and that thing about, oh, we don't want to intrude and, and et cetera, et cetera. But I think it's about explaining why you're collecting yeah. data. It's not yeah. just about collecting data. It's about, and I think that covers across a huge spectrum of um, different, uh, areas um, totally. So when we talk about it in the terms of homelessness, for example, the number of people that are at the the questions that people are asked when they make homeless applications, like there's no data around veterans, there's no data around, or well, there is, there's limited data around veterans, data around, uh, you know, uh, gender identity, uh, LGBT community would be largely missed. Absolutely. And, yeah. and people with learning disabilities, you can forget it. We just don't ask. And if you don't yeah. ask, you don't know, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. Uh, so you don't ask, you don't know. And I think people are, it's happy, are more happy to give their information when they understand why. Yeah. Um, it, 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 you can't just go, just ask them to say, totally. you, you can't just ask people to tell you things. You've got to say what, how you're going to use it and how it's going to benefit them as well. I think that's. And if we're really going to change things, we need that information. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, I, I, on that note, I think uh, we can we can wrap up there. Thank you so much for, for chatting. Um, it's been oh. a really good conversation i've been really great chatting to you and um, lovely to meet you an absolute pleasure pedro anytime i'm mm -hmm. always willing to chat we hope you enjoyed this discussion with charlie mcmillan just a reminder that everything discussed were the views of pedro and charlie and not necessarily the views of cash hoss or seld we really want to seek people's views from their experiences and perspectives and to get more people talking about these issues and speak across policy, practice and research. If you have anything you'd like to add to this conversation or you have your own perspectives, we'd love to hear from you. So please get in touch with Pedro at pedro at housingoptionsscotland.org.uk or visit www.housingoptionsscotland.org.uk.